What a great, great weekend. Um, you know, for, for quite some time, been looking forward to Friday and working and building up towards that and, and excited about uh, loving our community and doing it well. And so still kind of riding off of just the excitement of that. Um, I will tell you I'm a little sore. Um, I don't know if it's from basketball Thursday night or the block party and everything going on Friday and, and all of that or, or what, but, um, but I hurt in places that I haven't hurt for a while, and that, that's not a bad thing. I'm not complaining, um, but there's some excitement that helps overcome that, and I'm excited about tomorrow in Youth for Truth and praying for Matt and Crystal and the group that they'll have tomorrow, and uh, so cool that, that uh, the school is... Um, allowing them to have a room for that. And so um, just quickly, quick side note, if, if you see Mr. Drake, Mr. Deagle, I don't think it would be inappropriate or out of pocket for you to give them a huge thank you um, and just say, hey, we really appreciate your willingness to, to partner with us. The school has been amazing, uh, helping to promote both the block party and allowing us to do Youth for Truth. So we really appreciate that. So, so Friday, uh, really, really excited and had a great time with, with, with all of you serving our community. Looking forward to, to what uh, Youth for Truth is going to be doing beginning tomorrow. But I am super excited about what we're doing today. And we get to lift up the name of Jesus together and we're going to get into God's Word together with a new series called Revolution. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of 1 John. If you're grabbing a KDBC Bible, it's page 862. If you're not exactly sure where the book of 1 John is, if you want to go all the way back to the back and you got your maps or whatever, your concordance or whatever, you go Rev Revelation, Jude, and then we're going to just do a little countdown. 3, 2, 1. So 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. If you get to 2 Peter or 1 Peter, you've gone just a little bit too far. So a, a kind of a shorter book towards the end of the Bible. And we finished up a series last week looking at the gospel according to John, where John gave us um, from, from birth to death and resurrection, John gave us a, a great look at Jesus' life and ministry on earth. And, and what that means for us. But in John, the book of John, the gospel according to John, John was primarily writing about, again, Jesus' life. And, and so there's application that comes from that, but it's more application from observation. Like, and this is oftentimes uh, something that I enjoy, like reading in the Old Testament is, is there's a lot of application that's there in the Old Testament to be, to be gleaned, but you have, to, you have to open your eyes. You have to really observe. You have to dig into the text a little bit more to be able to pull some things out at times. And there's a lot to be observed in application from the gospel according to John. Also, a, a, a lot of very important just theological truths that are important to be nailed down. And the letter, the first letter that we have in Scripture that John wrote covers some of the things that he talked about when he talked about Jesus' life and ministry. If you know much about John, John's going to talk about Jesus. Okay? Whether it's talking about Jesus' life and just explaining this is what he did, this is what he said, this is how he responded, all of those kinds of things, or... In the letter that John writes that we're going to look at beginning today, he's writing about Jesus and what Jesus has done, but more so now there's application, but it's not application by observation, it's application by instruction. So this is what Jesus did, this is who Jesus is, this is what, Je what it means for your life. This is how it should change your life. Your life should be different because of Jesus. Well, what's the definition for revolution? A sudden or great change, a very important change in the way people do things, or to complete a circle. Now, there may be, and I'm going to pause 
just quickly and say there may be some, maybe not even any, and so I could just move on, but there might be one or two of you that say, wait a minute, this sounds a little familiar. Didn't we do a series on the book of 1 John several years ago? And didn't you call that series Revolution? And you would be right. Eight and a half years ago, I did a series on the book of 1 John called Revolution. Surprise? We're going to recycle it, but it's a remix. Okay, similar to when I was youth pastor and I had one of our teens come up to me afterwards and he had in his Bible, he had the papers. It wasn't a bulletin. We don't call papers that we hand out with youth ministry. We don't call those bulletins. But it's very similar. It has announcements on the front and the, and the teaching notes on the back. And he came up to me. He's like, Pastor Len, you did this series before. And I said, you're right. And I pointed it to him, and I said, look, it says the name of the series, and then it says Remix. Like, I know I did it before. I'm doing it again, but I'm switching it up a little bit. I'm not calling this one Remix, but just so you know, I know, yes, I've done this one before, and yes, some of the things that I'm going to share, I've shared with you before. But I also know about half of you weren't here eight years ago. I also know the other half of you, you don't remember half of the things I say anyway. <laughs> and all those that are guilty say amen. <laughs> Especially eight and a half years ago. So we're going to talk about change. And here's what I, I, I really believe. Like, it just made sense to me. and I felt like God was leading in this direction saying, okay, you did John, let's do first John. And talk about application, pulling this out, because I, I think God wants to revolutionize the way we see Him, the way we understand our relationship with Him, the way we love Him, the way we obey Him, and the way we love others. That God wants to revolutionize our lives. Let's use that, that last sentence there, that last definition, and we'll roll with that to complete a circle. A way of understanding the book of 1 John, there's four key things that John is going to talk about in this book. If I can get my notes to work right with me. There's no God John's going to tell us that we, we can know God. It's about having a relationship with God, not just knowing about God. And, and there's things, and it, it gets a little bit, it's, there's crossover, right? If you know somebody, you know about them. The, there are things about them that you will know, that you, you pick up on over time. You, you know their traits, their character, their tendencies, you know, their likes and their dislikes, all of that you, you begin to really pick up on. You, maybe you've heard some stories, but like the more you start hanging out with them, the more you, you know them and you know, yep, this is true or no, this is not true about them. And so one of the things that we'll see in this fairly short book of the Bible is the importance of knowing God, knowing God, not just knowing about God, but knowing God. And if you've, you've probably heard the, the statement before, to, to know someone, so think of someone, and to, to know them is to love them. And, and there are people that if I was to fill in the blank, to know so-and-so is to love so-and-so. It's like, you can't know this person and not just love who they are. And you can think of different ones. Like, to, to know them is to love them. And there is no one for whom that is more true than God. And so the next thing that we're going to see, John is going to talk about loving God. To know God is to love God. If you really know who God is, you'll love Him. You'll love Him. So John's going to talk to us a lot about loving God and what that looks like. And one of the things that John is very particular to point out 
is that to love God, we have to obey God. We'll see that in chapter 5, I believe it is. That those who love God obey His commands. The litmus test in many ways of whether or not you love God is, are you obeying God? Are you obeying God? And so John is going to talk about obedience. Obedience is critical. And so there's no God, love God, obey God. And then the last one that John's going to talk about, and it's not that all of these fall necessarily sequentially, like chapter 1 is this and chapter 2 is that, and then chapter, like, but we see this throughout. And we'll take a look at chapter 1 and part of chapter 2 today, and you'll see all four of these. Know God, love God, obey God, and then love others. We're going to know God, love God, obey God, and then love others. Those are are the four things that John will hit on throughout his writing. John chapter, 1 John chapter 1 through through chapter 5. We're going to learn about, about knowing God, loving God, obeying God, and loving others. So let's go ahead, 1 John chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at with our hands, have tu- and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. I love how John starts out, 1 John, much like he started out John, the gospel according to John. In the beginning was the Word. Very good. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. John's circling back to that. John's got the same story. It's his story and he's sticking to it. And it's not just that it's his story, it's the story of Jesus. John is all about Jesus. Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus in the nighttime, Jesus, 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 right? And he wants us to understand, like, (laughs) we testified, we've seen him, we touched him, he walked amongst us, we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, another theme that we saw in the gospel according to John, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. So very quickly, again, knowing who God is, and in particular, knowing the second of the Godhead, the Son of God, that Jesus is God, that Jesus is eternal. John's putting that in there right at the beginning. He's gonna, we're going to talk about practical application, but you have to have correct thinking to, to influence your correct living. And John wants us to be reminded, wants the readers to be reminded, that Jesus is the Son of God, that He's eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. Which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Very similar to what we saw in the Gospel according to John in John chapter 1. Verse 3, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Just quickly point out that he says so that. There's a purpose. So John is very intentional in writing. As we go through the rest of his letter, there's a purpose to it. He wants them to experience fellowship, two-tiered fellowship, fellowship with one another, and fellowship with the Lord. And John is connecting the two so that there's an understanding that the fellowship that we have together is the fellowship that we have with the Lord. Fellowship is, is pretty much a churchy word. You don't really hear fellowship a whole lot outside of the church other than when it's used like medically speaking, which is a completely different kind of understanding. 
Just a quick definition. You may want to write this down. Best definition I ever heard for fellowship was not, not in, in, uh, in college, getting training for, for being a preacher, being a pastor. It, it wasn't at any seminar that I've attended over the years about preaching and, and God's Word and things along that line and leading a church. Best definition, hands down, that I've ever seen, ever heard for fellowship came from one of our own teens several years ago. She said, fellowship is experiencing God together. Best definition for fellowship, in my opinion, ever. So John wants us to experience God together, that we have fellowship with God, we're experiencing Him ourselves, but that we have fellowship with one another, that we're experiencing God together. So we think alignment, right? This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. And so again, John is helping us be reminded who God is. Again, some themes that we saw in the gospel according to John. John talked about Jesus being the light, the light of the world, right? In him there is no darkness at all, which reminds us that God is what? He's holy, he's pure. There is no darkness at all. What? At all. Verse 6. If. Everybody say if. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet. So if we say one thing but we do something else. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not, with, not in us. So fellowship, we've said, is experiencing God together. And I have found that experiencing God together, fellowship, is where grace is best applied. Look at this verse again. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. Walking in the light, there's fellowship. And in that fellowship, I believe, is where grace is often best applied. The problem is when we fall to our own deceit. Well, no, I'm good. I think I'm walking in the light. I'm good. I, I don't need any help, right? Chapter 2, let's go ahead and uh, get about ankle deep into chapter 2. Then we'll pause and uh, share a couple things with you. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if, here's that word that John's going to use again, if... Anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours. I, I just want to pause, though, before I go to finish up and go to the next, next slide. If anybody does sin. One of the things that I love about the book of 1 John is John's view of grace. John has a very optimistic view of grace. John has a very powerful, optimistic understanding of what Christ wants to do and can do and has done on behalf of those who put their faith in him through the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, I write this so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin. So there's this understanding that sin does not have to be a part of our life. That is, that is awesome news to me. One of the reasons why I like the book of 1 John and one of the reasons why I like Wesleyan theology because it holds an optimistic view and understanding of God's grace as outlined 
in Scripture, not because this is what we hope for, but because this is what God's Word indicates. We continue on. But also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know Him. Again, think back to our circle. We know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commands. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not do what He commands, is a what? Is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. So first thing that I think John wants us to say or, and just kind of pause is that we need to check our alignment between belief and behavior. Check our alignment between belief and behavior. Now it's important to catch the tone that John is using here. John's not writing as a grumpy old man, though he is an old man at this time. I haven't found a, a scholar one, uh, commentary or otherwise, that does not say that John is the only disciple of the twelve left alive at this point. Up in age. He is old, but he's not grumpy. There is tenderness in his voice, there's firmness in his writing but there's tenderness. It, in some ways, he's like just that loving grandfather that's going to pull you up on the knee and, and tell you a good story and love on you, but is also going to help set you straight. And maybe you had a grandparent like that or maybe a grandparent figure in your life that has served in that kind of way, but that is, spiritually speaking, that is what John is, is going to do here, and, and he's just saying, hey, hey, kids, and, and he'll even say, my, my dear children, like, listen up, so, some of you, you're, you're saying one thing, and you're living another way, you need to check your alignment between belief and behavior. Brendan Manning had this quote, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. And so John reminds us, instructs us, application need to check the alignment between belief and behavior. Belief, the importance of having right, and we talk about um, alignment, the importance of having right belief is orthodoxy. Ortho, many of you are familiar, you can take the prefix ortho and you think of some different things that come after it, like orthodontist. What does an orthodontist do? They align teeth, Right? They make straight what is crooked, what's off, right? Or you think of an um, orthopedic or other ones. They, they look at making alignment where something is, is off. The importance of having orthodoxy, correct beliefs. So John is going to address correct beliefs. He's already given us some very important stones in, in correct belief, markers that have to be there, who Jesus is, the Son of God, He's eternal, He came in the flesh, all things that are important, things about what we believe, much of which we looked at in the gospel according to John, and some of which He'll cover again in First John. But then there's not just orthodoxy, there's orthopraxy. There's correct living, correct behavior. And there needs to be alignment between belief and behavior. So let's go back to our, our little drawing, our little outline here. At the top, what did I say that we had? No God. Then what? Love God. Good job. Then what? Obey God. So what we're seeing here, John is telling us that there needs to be alignment 
between knowing God and obeying God. Not only do we say, well, to obey God is to love God, and to love God is to obey God. To know God, to love God is to obey God. We say to know God is to obey God. That there has to be alignment between what we believe, we claim Jesus is Lord, right? That's what we claim. So if we claim Jesus is Lord, what, how must we live? Like Jesus is Lord. If Jesus is Lord, what does that mean? When he says, thou shalt not, we say, thou shalt not. We don't say, let me pull the audience. Let me ask a friend. We say, okay. If God says, thou shalt do something, we say, yep, okay, yes, sir. There's obedience, there's alignment. Because we know who he is, we know that he's God, we know that he's all-powerful, we also know that he's a, a loving God. That's why it's easy to love him, right? We love him because he first loved us. And because we love him, we obey him, we trust him, so there's alignment between knowing him and obeying him. There's alignment between what we say and what we do. John's going to continue to touch on this as we go through the rest of 1 John. When it comes to obedience and it comes to sin, we, there's a little bit of this understanding of, well, I, kind of defeatism. Like, I, I just can't help it. I, I'm going to lose. I'm going to sin every day. I'm going to mess up all the time. And I love, again, the optimism in the book of 1 John that John has towards grace and towards life. But I like in the way that many of us approach life and approach sin as something that happened at the block party. So while we're at the block party, uh, I was doing uh, some check-in. I had taken some bottles of water to the different uh, inflatable stations. And one of our, I think she's in sixth grade now. I'm going to go ahead and say her, her name. Brooklyn came up to me and said, P Pastor Lynn, will you race me on the obstacle course? So I shared a video on Facebook of Brooklyn and I racing on the obstacle course. She said, Pastor Lynn, will you race me? I said, well, just a minute. I need to finish up passing out the bottles. I think I had a couple bottles left. I'll finish that up, then we'll get in line. I'll race you. So come around. We get, get to ready to get in line, and her mom and dad are over there, and her dad comes. He's like, yeah, I told her that if she would ask you to race her, and if she beats you, I'd give her 10 bucks. <laughs> I said, well, you're going to lose your 10 bucks. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, she's, she's young. I'm not. <laughs> she's agile. If you know Brooklyn, she's agile. And let's just say, I'm not. Like, if, if, we, if we were racing... 40 yards, I might have a chance. Straight away, I don't have to climb over anything. I might have a chance. But on this obstacle course, if you saw the obstacle course, no way. And it's funny, as, as, uh, as, if you watch the, the video, Dwayne's filming, and he's like, all right, I'm going. And then like, oh, he's not where I thought he'd be, and he has to come back. But we're getting in line, we're, so we're in line, and, and uh, so I said, so, Brooklyn, if I let you win, which wasn't the issue, if I let you win, will you split your, your $10 with me? It's like, yeah, I, I can do that. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like I'm not going to win. I, I knew, right? As soon as she asked me, will you race me, like, I know I'm not going to win. She's been doing it. I've, I've seen her run through. I know how she is. How, she's agile and all of that and, and fits in that obstacle course much easier than I do. Like, I, know, I knew it going in. There's no way I'm going uh, no to win, which I don't like to do things that I know I'm not going to win. Don't even have a chance. But 
it is more about kids and family than winning, right? So swallow my pride. But I say all that just because I knew I, I knew it. And isn't that a horrible way to live life, though? Expecting to lose? And that's why, again, one of the reasons why I love the book of 1 John. Because there's the expectation of obedience, but there's also the understanding that it's possible to obey Him. It's possible to obey Him. And we'll talk more about obedience as we go through 1 John and living for the Lord so that there is alignment between what we say and what we do. Go back to chapter 2, verse 5. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And then skip over to verse 9. Anyone who claims, again, we have this word that John is using a lot. Anyone who claims to be in the light must, but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who claims to be in the light, yes, I'm in the light. Yes, I'm in right relationship with God. Yes, I love Jesus. And he says, if you love Jesus, but you hate your brother or sister, you're what? You're still in the dark. There's another thing that we need to see here. We need to check the love alignment. We need to check the love alignment. Let's go back. You guys did so good with us before. We said up top, we need to know God. Then we say we need to love God. And then we said we need to obey God. And then obeying God means we will what? Love others. John's talked about this a lot. In the gospel according to John, he's going to talk a lot more about it as we go through the book of John. The greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. And the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. John quotes his best friend, his Lord, Jesus. Jesus is all about loving God, the vertical relationship, and loving others, the horizontal relationship. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. John's told us all of that in the gospel according to John. John's going to come back to that again and again through the book of 1 John because not only do we have to have this alignment here, we must have this alignment here. We, we must have love alignment. There must be a love alignment. There must be a love with God and a love for others. If we can't love our brothers and sisters, and we're not talking about specifically those that share our own DNA. It begins by looking at those who share the blood of Christ. But John's going to continue to unpack it and loving others means loving those whom Christ died for. The world. Just like Jesus loves the world. So there's a love alignment. How we love God and how we love others. There must be alignment there. There's, it's so, so important. What I want to point out is, and Michael saw this earlier. Some of you see it in some ways, but maybe didn't point it out. Michael saw this, he said there's a, a circle and a cross. Some of you just look at it and you like cross hairs, but there's a, a cross. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of all of these. If we want to know what it looks like to know God, we look at Jesus. We look at Jesus. You want to know what it looks like to love God? Look at Jesus. Look, uh, just look at, look at Jesus' love for the Father. You want to know how to love God? 
Look at Jesus. You want to know how to obey God? What do you do? Look at Jesus, right? You, you look at Jesus. How did Jesus obey God? With everything. Complete and full surrender to the Father. Why? He loved him. He trusted him. He loves him. He trusts him. It's complete obedience. And how to love others? Again, we look to God. We look to Jesus. Today, September 11th, those of you that are old enough to remember, no doubt can, can remember what you were doing, what you were thinking, as different things started to happen. As the day started to unfold and we learned about different airplanes hitting the World Trade Center, one crash again in D.C., and then we start, caught news later on of a, another plane, Flight 93, Sela shared this picture with me um, earlier this summer. Sela visited her aunt in Pennsylvania, and they took a little day trip to the crash site of Flight 93, and these are the, the crew and passengers of that flight. Pretty surreal scene, uh, showed some other pictures and different things that they have at the memorial there for Flight 93. But one person in particular, his story has caught the attention of, of many throughout the nation and probably the, the most well-known of all those that were on Flight 93, Todd Beamer. Um, side note, uh, the Student Center at Wheaton College, which uh, I was at earlier in the summer for our district conference, is, uh, was named after him because he and his wife attended school there, and uh, they, shortly after 9-11, they ended up naming the student center, the, the Beamer Student Center, after him. Sometime after his death, uh, his wife wrote a book based off of the, probably the most well-known statement connected to, maybe the most well-known statement connected to 9-11, as Todd Beamer was on Flight 93 and started understanding what had taken place, that the plane had been overtaken, they started getting some news about other planes crashing into buildings and things. And so he and a couple other passengers, I believe, if I have my information correct, some other passengers got together and they started talking through some things about what they might need to do. And he ended up making a phone call. He was trying to talk to his wife, Lisa, kind of one final, most likely one final goodbye. Ended up talking to another Lisa that was with customer service. Asked her to say the Lord's Prayer with him and then basically leaves her on the line as he goes back to the guys and says, everybody ready? And like, there's the affirmative. And then he says, let's roll. And we don't know exactly what happened after that. But we do know that Flight 93 did not take the lives of any other civilians on 9-11. And in the book that she wrote called Let's Roll, she writes this. What made Todd different from many other men who are merely religious was not the fact that he was willing to die for his faith. The terrorists did that. Catch this. No, Todd was willing to live for his faith. Todd was willing to live for his faith. She goes on and says, Todd built his life on a firm foundation so that when the storm came on September 11th, he didn't have to check the blueprints to see if everything he had built his life on was going to stand. He knew. It's as if, like, Todd knew the Lord, loved the Lord, obeyed the Lord, loved others. His life was all about God. It goes back to that, that one verse 
I think it's verse 5 of chapter 2, about living in Him, a life that is, that's His. The question that I have is, will you join the revolution? I believe Todd was a part of the revolution. Loving God, loving others, walking in obedience, trusting in God. Few questions that maybe kind of go along with that. It's possible that there are some, maybe even here in the sanctuary, in the Fellowship Hall, or listening online, that don't know God. It's hard to, it's impossible to complete the circle. You can try to obey God without knowing God, but it won't work. We'll talk more about that as we go. It, it won't work. It will leave you super, super frustrated. It will leave you empty. It will leave you even more broken than you are right now if you're just trying to obey God without really knowing God. And so the invitation would be to, to step into a relationship with God and just say, I don't know a lot about you, but what I understand about myself is I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I believe Jesus came and died on the cross for my sins. You died for me, now help me to live for you. And you begin a relationship with God. Knowing God. And as you know Him more and more, you will love Him more and more. And He'll help you to obey Him more and more and to love others more and more. Many who hear me right now, though, you know God, you've, you've walked with God or you've, you've prayed a prayer, you believe in God, you claim God, but if truth be told, there's, there's misalignment between what you believe and what you and how you behave there's misalignment between what you proclaim or claim and how you live and john reminds us that there must be alignment between knowing him and obeying him and again there may be some that claim to love god but truth be told, we're doing pretty horrible about loving those around us. We'll talk about why that's so difficult in the coming weeks. But we need to just have a heart-to-heart -heart with, <laughs> with ourselves and with the Lord and say, Lord, I know I'm not where I need to be. The alignment is off. My love alignment is off. Maybe not loving him like you should, or maybe not loving him like you should because you're not loving others like you should. Let's ask the true alignment adjuster to work, to do his work, shall we? As Paul comes to lead us in these closing songs, I, I wanna, want you to just bow your heads, close your eyes. You don't have to do those things, but God specializes in life change. And I believe God wants to change our lives, revolutionize how we know Him, love Him, obey Him, and love others. Spend a little time with Him.